Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar for the 2023 edition of ACEEE's State Transportation Electrification Scorecard. We will be discussing the results and findings from our report, which we released today. My name is Shruti Vaidinathan. I'm the Transportation Program Director here at ACEEE, and I will be your moderator today. Um, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, we are recording this webinar and will be making it available to all registrants within a few business days. We will also provide the slides to all registrants. To ask a question during the webinar, please submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to it during our question and answer session at the end of the webinar. The audience can upvote questions you think are particularly good, and we will prioritize those. Members of the audience are off camera and muted by default. You can talk with one another and network via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel of speakers today. They are Peter Huther, Senior Transportation Research Associate with ACEEE and lead author of the 2023 State Transportation Electrification Scorecard. Jennifer Califit, Senior Manager for Energy Efficiency and Transportation Electrification at the California Public Utilities Commission. And Adam Ruder, Assistant Director for the Clean Transportation Group at NYSERDA. Um, before we move on to the speakers, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce ACEEE's transportation research and provide some background for the report we're releasing today. Next slide, please. For those of you not familiar with our organization, ACEEE is a nonprofit that acts as a catalyst to advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, investments, and behaviors. Transportation is now responsible for 28% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. To address the growing urgency of the climate crisis, ACEEE conducts research on policies to scale up the adoption of efficient vehicle technologies, while also promoting the creation of sustainable, low carbon passenger and freight transportation systems. We advocate for a set of policy measures to achieve ambitious reductions in transportation related energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, while also improving livability, health and access to efficient transportation for all. Electrified transportation is the centerpiece to reducing transportation related emissions. ACEEE supports the deployment of EVs in ways that maximize both social and environmental benefits. For instance, we support the use of electric transit options in historically marginalized communities as a means of improving access to efficient low carbon transportation options, reducing health impacts from transportation related pollution and addressing greenhouse gas emissions. The transportation electrification scorecard is reflective of that approach. Our report highlights what state actors specifically are doing to create a supportive policy environment to assist the transition towards electrified personal and shared passenger vehicles, freight vehicle fleets and transit and school buses in an effort to ensure equitable access to the benefits of transportation electrification. As you will soon see, states continue to make mixed progress on their transportation electrification journeys. Electric vehicles still just make up 7% of the light duty vehicle American uh, light duty American vehicle market, yet ambitious national climate and sales goals demand a much faster transition to an electrified light and heavy duty fleet. Many states are still grappling with the best ways to encourage their uptake in a way that meets transportation, economic and climate goals. But before I give too much away, let me turn it over to our lead author, Peter Huther, Senior Transportation Research Associate to provide an overview of this year's scorecard results and main takeaways. Peter, over to you. Great, thank you, Shruti, and thank you to our excellent lineup of speakers. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so first, I just want to take some time to go over the goals of the scorecard. As Shruti said, states are making mixed progress when it comes to electrifying the transportation sector, and the overarching goals of this scorecard is to make is to benchmark all the states on their policies and progress. This includes highlighting the progress since our last scorecard, which came out in 2021. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a core goal of transportation electrification, and the scorecard can show how state EV policies can maximize these reductions across the sector. Scaling both EVs and EV chargers will be crucial to meeting our climate goals, and there are many promising policies we highlight in the scorecard. Lastly, based on feedback we received from our 2021 edition, we're putting a greater focus on state efforts to advance equity in their TE policies and how they are accelerating the transition of heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. So the metrics we assess in the scorecard are divided into five different policy areas. First is EV planning. Uh, next is EV financial incentives. 
um, transportation system efficiency, electricity grid optimization, and outcomes. The breakdown in points is reflective of the importance of different policy areas on increasing ED, EV deployment with ZEB band dates and targets and financial incentives for EV purchases and charging infrastructure investment taking a large por portion of total points. However, it is important to recognize the importance of reducing overall transportation emissions, integrating EVs onto the grid, and tackling outcomes as well. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, since our last edition, based on feedback from community groups, as well as other stakeholders, we have integrated equity throughout the policy areas instead of having it as a separate instead of having it as a separate policy area. Uh, equity is not an add-on in our transportation policy, but should be central in all policy areas. So last time we had six, and now we're moving down to five. Um, we have also increased the focus on equity, increasing the number of points from 10 to 17 and a half. Um, and these will be um, metrics throughout uh, all the other policy areas. We've also increased the number of points uh, or placed a greater emphasis on heavy duty electrification, especially electric school buses based on feedback and all of the recent federal action. Um, and lastly, we've upped the ambition of a few metrics, including by emphasizing binding targets over non-binding ones. Um, and of note, we've allocated four points each for states adopting California's Advanced Clean Cars 2 standards and Advanced Clean Truck standards. Uh, next slide. Now the results. Um, uh, California came in first again with 88 points, followed by New York in second again with 62 points. Um, Colorado is newly in third place with 61 points, followed by Massachusetts and Vermont with 57 and a half points and 57 points respectively. The top 10 in this edition is largely the same as last time, although there has been some reshuffling. Um, you'll see that, of course, um, the coasts and the Northeast um, have had some of the best performing states, but there are um, good actions happening throughout the country. Um, Oklahoma, for instance, has a, had the biggest increase in rank, while Colorado had the biggest increase in score. Unfortunately, though, many states, um, especially those who have seen major EV and EV battery manufacturing investments in recent months, did not perform as well, highlighting the need for improvement so that drivers in those states can benefit from the vehicles produced there. Next slide. And while there is a wide variation in approaches the different states are taking, there are some common actions as well. We are glad to see that 34 states have started the EV planning process, which is crucial in managing the transition. Utilities around the country are also taking strong actions, including offering time varying rates for L2 chargers in 38 states, which will help tremendously as more EVs are on the roads. Um, L2 charges are also being incentivized in many states, and states are seeing the benefits of electric school bus buses and leveraging federal funds. Uh, next slide. And again, this year, we found that there is considerable room for improvement across the board, but states have a diverse set of policy actions to choose from. There's something every state can work on, and there's a policy option for every state. We found that policies that promote and center equity in particular are areas which need improvement, as only California was received more than half of the points allocated for equity. Transportation system efficiency was also an area that could use improvement, included by having transportation sector greenhouse gas and reduction targets and greenhouse gas emission prices, as well as focusing on transit and school bus electrification. There can also be more progress to, to electrify heavy duty vehicles and plan for their charging needs. Um, and we also found that utilities continuing to invest in the EV transition with an additional 760 million committed by uh, utilities since our last scoring card in EV and EV charging infrastructure investments. Uh, next slide. So we have a number of recommendations in the report and we separate our recommendations based on where the state is in the process of electrifying the transportation sector. Our foundational recommendations are for states just starting out um, and these include the need for comprehensive planning and data collection. It's important that states are facilitating and supporting the transition with data so that their drivers, roads, and grids are prepared. We also encourage states to incorporate equity into their investments and planning processes so that no one is left behind and everyone can benefit from the transition. And this includes early and often community engagement so that voices of traditionally underserved communities are heard and that their needs are met. 
There's also been historic levels of federal funding, and it's important that those states that states take advantage full advantage of this funding and leverage it to meet their EV goals. Next slide. So for states further along we, who want to accelerate the transition, we firstly recommend adopting Advanced Clean Cars 2 and Advanced Clean Trucks, which are California standards that aim to put ever-increasing percentage of uh, EVs on, on the roads, as well as codifying other targets to give certainty to the market and support all other investments that the states are making. We're glad to see all the states who have adopted or are considering adopting one or both of, of the California standards, and we encourage more states to do so. We also continue to stress the importance of financial incentives to tackle the high upfront costs of EVs um, and to accelerate their uptake. More states could enact financial incentives for EV purchases, especially heavy duty purchases, as well as support the growth of EV charging. As I said, utilities are continuing to invest in EVs and EV charging infrastructure, and it is up to states and their utility, utility commissions to ensure that these investments are fair and reasonable, incorporate equity, and effectively integrate EVs onto the grid. Utilities have a key role to play in the transition, and states have a key role to set their framework for utility actions. Uh, we would also encourage more states to adopt transportation sector greenhouse gas reduction goals to ensure that their policies are effectively reducing emissions, including by electrifying and promoting transit and other forms of non-personal vehicle transportation. And last but not least, we implore states to engage with their communities, especially underserved communities, through this process and align their funding with, the, with their needs and consider following the lead of, Just, of the Justice 40 initiative and dedicating 40% of funding for underserved communities. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone involved in writing and producing this report, including my main co-authors, Carolyn, Jasmine, and Ethan. And I'm excited to hear from our great speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for that great overview. Um, just a reminder for our audience, um, feel free to submit uh, questions uh, using the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll be able to answer uh, them during our session at the end. Um, so next up, uh, we have uh, Jennifer Califoot from the California Public Utilities Commission. Jennifer has over 20 years of experience in the energy, environment, and human rights sectors across government and nonprofit organizations, and her background is in public policy and international development. She was previously appointed by Governor Jerry Brown as Chief of Staff to a CPUC Commissioner from 2016 to 2018, where she spearheaded zero emission vehicle policy for the Commission. She holds a Master of Public Administration from Rutgers University and a Bachelor of Science in Sociology from the University of Illinois. Jennifer, uh, take it away. Hello, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to take part in this webinar. Today, um, I wanna highlight some of the progress that California has made in advancing transportation electrification, and more specifically, what the role of my agency, the California Public Utilities Commission has been. Next slide. First and foremost, we had a huge milestone this year. In, in 2012, then Governor Jerry Brown set a goal to hit 1.5 million zero emission vehicle sales by 2025. And I'll say at the time, we thought that this was a really ambitious goal. I think in 2012, we had less than 1% of our car sales in the States being zero emission vehicles. But this year, California surpassed that goal two years ahead of schedule with 21% of all new cars sold in California this year being ZEVs and 40% of the ZEVs sold in the US are sold in California. Next slide. More recently in September of 2020, California Governor Newsom established new zero emission vehicle targets. Specifically by 2035, 100% of in-state sales of new passenger cars and light duty trucks will be zero emissions. Also by 2035, off-road vehicles and equipment operations will be 100% zero emission. And third, we aim for 100% zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles in the state by 2045. Finally, a couple years ago as well, Governor Newsom announced an historic $10 billion ZEV package to accelerate the transition to zero emission vehicles. This investment will build on the goals that we established in 2020 and targets billions of dollars towards disadvantaged communities to support vehicle purchases, electric school bus programs, and access to community-based tran transportation equity projects. 
Increasing and accelerating the shift to zero emission transportation systems requires an organized and collaborative and cross-cutting approach. In that regard, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development spearheaded the development of the zero emission vehicle market development strategy. This document outlines how state agencies and stakeholder groups key to our transportation sector transition can move together with the scale and speed required to reach the state's ZEB targets. Next slide. There are many state agencies involved in this effort. As part of the statewide strategy, state agencies have developed ZEB action plans. And these are concise and ambitious documents that are designed to share ZEB priorities, foster alignment across the agencies, and ensure agency actions are coordinated. Next slide. So what is the CPUC's role in this electrification effort? Um, as Peter already mentioned, and I think it's broadly recognized, electric utilities play a key role in supporting and, in, and enabling the TE market, specifically because they are the fuel providers for electric vehicles and they're the distribution grid operators. So they control how much, how that fuel gets to the cars. In that regard, as regulators of the state's investor-owned utilities, we see our work on transportation electrification falling along a few key categories. First, charging station infrastructure deployment and incentives, vehicle grid integration policy, electric rates and cost of fueling, distribution infrastructure and grid planning, and of course, interagency collaboration on broader ZEB strategy. Across all these areas, we try to embed equity and ensure that all Californians have access to TE benefits. This is a focal point. Next slide. So let me just touch briefly on a few of these roles. Um, the CPUC has been providing ratepayer funded incentives through investor owned utility programs since 2016. We refer to these legacy programs as funding cycle zero. To date, we've authorized around $1.6 billion in funding. This budget has gone to support a wide, to support widespread transportation electrification, including for light duty vehicles, initial programs focused primarily on building chargers and make readies at multi-unit dwellings and workplaces. We also had other programs uh, focused on incentivizing DC fast charging and level two charging at public sites like schools, parks, and beaches. Some of our funding cycle zero incentives also went to medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification, supporting charging and infrastructure for a wide range of on-road and off-road vehicles. Moving to the funding cycle one, which is the green arrow in the middle, uh, which will launch in 2025, we're shifting from a more disparate application by application TE program review to a landscape of a single uniform program. With this new uniform rebate program, we will streamline funding into two key market segments, medium and heavy duty charging stations and EV charging solutions for residents at multi-unit dwellings. We think that these targeting segments are critical both because of the existing and forthcoming regulations that are expected to rapidly accelerate adoption of medium and heavy duty electric vehicles and because EV charging is still a large barrier for people who live in apartment buildings, condo buildings, or other buildings that may not have convenient op options for charging. I just also wanna make another point on equity. For our part, we've been focused on equity and the availability of incentives from utility programs. Specifically in funding cycle zero, we'll be targeting higher rebates for multi-unit dwelling, dwellings where a majority of the residents are income qualified. Second, for medium and heavy duty customers whose businesses are based in communities of concern and potentially higher rebates for small fleet customers and medium heavy duty customers in tribal communities. So finally, um, funding cycle two, which is the purple box here, is left more open-ended. We're gonna be studying the need for additional support for customer charging infrastructure in the coming year, balance in the coming years, I should say, balance against the role of the utility as a fuel provider and distribution grid operator. Next slide. Another area I wanted to touch on briefly is our work on vehicle grid, grid integration. Vehicle grid integration or VGI 
broadly refers to a suite of actions that shape vehicle charging behavior, such as changing the time or level of charging or how power is sent back to the grid from vehicles in a way that maximizes benefits both for the customer, the EV owner, and the grid. The CPUC has been involved in grid, vehicle grid integration development for about the past decade as well. Since 2013, we've implemented a number of RD&D and pilot programs to study technologies, program designs, electricity rates, all that test the feasibility and customer interest in both having their EV charging, charging managed and programs that will export energy from the vehicle battery to the home or to the grid. Notably, in 2019, California Senate Bill 676 required the Commission to establish strategies and quantifiable metrics to maximize the use of BGI. Sort of pursuant to that legislation and the previous working groups that we had been running along with the outcomes of the pilot programs, we adopted a decision in 2020 that establishes at a very high level of VGI strategy. This decision also established an annual VGI stakeholder, strategic stakeholder forum, which will actually launch this fall in 2023. And it will create a path for an ongoing strategic uh, communication and transparency around VGI. Um, if I have a little more time, I want to draw special attention to this 2022 um, decision which adopted a plug-in electric vehicle submetering protocol and communication protocols. This sounds really wonky as I say it, but it's really important. A submeter measures an electric vehicle's energy use independent from a customer's main meter without the need to install a separate utility meter. This is critical because it provides the EV driver with an opportunity to charge their vehicle on a lower cost EV specific rate separate from their alternative home rate or alternative business rate. This also promotes the development of vehicle grid integration because customers can participate in programs that are specific to how and when they charge their EVs. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. Finally, I just wanna emphasize the important work that we are undertaking planning for the forthcoming electricity load associated with EVs. We've been working to identify issues in our existing planning efforts to support both near-term needs for fleets and other sites ready to build out EV charging and to anticipate longer lead time projects that will, require, that will require more significant upgrades to our distribution and even transmission systems. Key barriers to effectively deploying EV charging include long lead times for utility interconnection, infrastructure siting constraints and availability, permitting, energization timeline, gener generation optimization, the availability of the workforce and other things. However, earlier this year, several California state agencies signed a statement of intent, which outlines how our agencies are working together to ensure that charging station build out and electric grid planning aligns with the vehicle rollout schedules associated with our goals and regulatory programs, including Advanced Clean Cars 2 and the Advanced Clean Fleet Regulations. Leveraging the existing interagency coordination and planning frameworks, staff at the Public Utilities Commission, the California Independent Service Operator, the California Energy Commission and the Air Resources Board, among others, are working closely to ensure that our processes and our planning for the expected growth in EV adoption over the next decade. Next slide. Again, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in the web webinar today. We're honored to be recognized for our efforts in this space, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that great overview of what's happening in California right now. It's always interesting to hear updates from the state. Um, we'll turn now to Adam Ruder from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority to share a few remarks on New York State transportation and electrification efforts. Um, Adam's work focuses on developing and demonstrating new technologies, policies, and business models that support three key focus areas, electric vehicles, public transportation, and mobility management. Adam has led the implementation of New York State's Charge NY initiative to advance electric vehicle adoption in New York State. 
and he closely collaborates with other states and the federal government to jointly advance EV policies and programs. Um, take it away, Adam. Thank you, Shruti, and, and thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, so uh, it's always tough following following a presentation from California, but uh, we're doing some great things in New York as well on transportation and electrification. And um, you know, sales are rising rapidly in New York. Um, <clears throat> we uh, just hit 150,000 EVs on the road, uh, which, uh, while while well short of California, is is. Uh, quite an accomplishment, and and we still boast uh, the most energy efficient uh, transportation sector in the country, uh, thanks in large part to so many uh, transit rider, so much transit ridership here. Uh, but uh, sales have continued to increase rapidly. Uh, we see more and more models available. Um, medium and heavy duty uh, Zev sales are still still starting to to um, take hold, but. We know that there are a lot of models that are available and we're seeing more and more participation in our programs for medium and heavy duty vehicles. We expect those numbers to start going up very quickly. Um, this is in part because we have very ambitious climate goals that have been set uh, as part of our Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act or uh, CLCPA, uh, which set net zero targets uh, for greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and a 40% reduction by 2030. Um, all the work that we've done to figure out how we're going to uh, accomplish, accomplish this uh, indicates that we need to get somewhere between two and three million uh, light duty EVs on the road, and which make up more than will make up more than 90% of new sales. And, uh, and upwards of 80,000 medium and heavy duty EVs on the road, about 40% of new sales by 2030, uh, which means we need to push even harder and, uh, and, and further than, uh, than we have to date. Fortunately, we have plans and, uh, and we are taking actions. We have, uh, we, we've adopted advanced clean cars too and advanced clean trucks uh, in, in the wake of California's approval of those programs. We have vehicle rebates, both for light duty ZEVs and for medium and heavy duty ZEVs. Uh, these are both uh, per point of purchase, point of sale incentives. Um, and we've seen uh, uh, vast interest in both of these programs. So we're really excited about um, about where they're going to go from here and, and how that is helping to catalyze the market in ways that uh, are, are needed to meet the regulations and, and frankly go beyond uh, the regulations uh, that, that are in place. Uh, I won't go through all these programs, but uh, we have a number of different uh, approaches that we're taking to, um, to uh, the zero emission vehicle infrastructure, in particular EV charging. Um, this includes utility uh, utility-led programs that have been approved by the Public Service Commission uh, for make-ready uh, programs and new EV tariffs, um, investments by the New York Power Authority uh, in DC fast chargers, uh, the uh, advancement of the uh, NEVI funds from through the state DOT. Uh, NYSERDA has run some targeted programs for level two and uh, DC fast charger uh, stations. And uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation has led programs for municipalities, and we have state tax credits on top of the federal tax credits. So uh, we've we've really tried to hit a lot of the different uh, areas to, to make sure that charging station build out uh, is happening efficiently and quickly uh, across the state. On the equity front, uh, we have been trying to advance the uh, transportation uh, equity in transportation and electrification um, in ways that go beyond uh, car ownership. Uh, in 2021, we announced uh, the uh, the uh, New York Clean Transportation Prizes, an $85 million program that's focused on demonstrating innovative approaches. Uh, to transportation electrification in disadvantaged communities. There were three categories of projects and we funded 10 projects total. 
a clean neighborhoods challenge that really focused on uh, neighborhood scale and community scale projects uh, that address air pollution reduction, um, but also really address community transformation through uh, transportation electrification. Electric mobility challenge, which really focuses on uh, safe and convenient electric uh, mobility options for residents of disadvantaged communities and electric truck and bus challenge, which really advances uh, advances the state of knowledge on electrification of these uh, these larger vehicles and uh, the potential for doing so in a way that that is uh, cognizant of and and uh, less impactful to the electric grid. These projects are just getting underway. We made awards uh, in November 2022. And the projects, uh, some of them are just uh, launching their services and, and getting trucks and buses on the road this summer. We are really excited uh, for, for these, but as you can see, they're across the state in urban environments and some more rural environments. And uh, we are doing a, a huge uh, push to collect data and uh, develop case studies for all of these projects to try to make sure that these are transferable and replicable and scalable and, and uh, importantly, sustainable as well. And finally, um, I want to focus in a little bit on medium and heavy duty uh, electrification, specifically with electric school buses. I think New York State um, has uh, the most aggressive uh, school bus electrification mandate in the country. We are uh, we are well underway, but by 2027, all school bus purchases in the state must be zero emission vehicles. And by 2035, all school buses in operation uh, must be zero emission. Um, this is a huge undertaking uh, going, and it, it needs to be said that New York State has more school buses uh, in operation than any other state in the country, uh, about 45,000. Um, we are going to be releasing an electric school bus roadmap and guidebook this summer that details some of the policy uh, options that are in front of us for helping to support this, uh, this initiative, and also a really practical hands-on guidebook for school bus operators on how they can uh, do this transition. But this is all going to be aided by $500 million uh, that were approved by voters in November, uh, in November 2022, uh, which is dedicated for electric uh, school bus electrification. Um, this is going to help us get uh, a lot of school buses on the road and importantly, get school bus fleets prepared for this transition. This isn't something that they can just do. Uh, on a whim. It's not something that they can do, um, you know, with the limited experience they have. They're going to need help, uh, and and we're here to help them. We are offering technical assistance. Uh, we're helping funding with funding. Uh, New York State is pursuing a lot of EPA funding as well, and New York received more EPA funding in the first round of the Clean School Bus Program uh, than any other state. And um, we are working to help our, our school districts uh, receive even more of that in the future. So that's a quick overview of, of uh, some of the highlights of what we're doing, but uh, there's much more uh, in place and much more on the way. We're really excited about where things are headed and working with other states and, and our, and our uh, state key stakeholders like ACEEE uh, to make sure that we get we achieve these goals. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. It seems like New York is really giving California a run for its money here. So I'm very glad to see um, the width and breadth of all the programs that you just described. Um, so I want to take a moment to thank our speakers so much for joining us today. I'm going to ask them all to come on online for the uh, Q and A session. Um, so we're going to take some time to address some of the great questions we've gotten from the audience. Um, this has been one of the most active Q&A um, panels that I've seen in a long time. So just as a reminder, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom. 
And if you are a member of a press, I should have probably said this in the beginning, uh, just please uh, uh, flag your outlet for us when you submit um, your comment. But uh, let's get started here. So there have been a couple of clarifying questions that have come in for Peter about the um, scorecard rankings and methodology. So one of the first that we got is um, uh, a viewer would like us to describe what we qualify as the EV planning process. Um, and when you said that those 34 states with EV planning processes, um, uh, 34 states received points for, the, for their EV planning process, was that inclusive of both state planning and utility planning or just one and the other? Sure, that's a great question. So firstly, that is specifically just around state planning. There actually is a separate metric around um, utility EV planning. Um, and we also encourage um, states to have their utilities plan for the EVs that are going to be on the grid, as well as have a comprehensive plan for any investments that they get approved for. Um, but so what constitutes the EV planning, there's we took a there's a, a variety of things that states um, a variety of types of plans that states can can submit that we would count. Um, some of them took part in multi-state efforts to plan for EVs, um, and some of them have their own um, plans and targets in place. Um, we did not um, count the, the NEVI plan specifically as, as well for this, given that every state was required to do so. Um, and they were specifically just to the money that um, is, is being allocated from that program. Um, but I, I would encourage anyone who's particularly interested in what these plans look like um, to go into the appendix um, of, the, of the scorecard um, to get some more information and find some examples. Thanks, Peter. That's a great point. Our scorecard appendix is uh, comprehensive for all the data that we collected. So if you have any questions on those um, items, also please feel free to reach out to the team here. Um, so the next question we have is about EV ready building codes. And um, so, uh, one of our attendees would like to know um, how the scorecard considered EV ready building codes, given that uh, access to charging is the number one barrier to light duty EV adoption. Yeah, so we did look at um, what states are requiring um, of, of buildings in the state, um, and we took um, two different approaches to that. Um, so we looked at if the state is requiring all, all new buildings in the state to, to be at certain a certain level of EV readiness, but then we also look, if the state is not requiring itself, we also looked at if if large cities in the state that constitute a significant portion of the population were doing it, uh, given that sometimes um, there are many cases where if there isn't a state level requirement, some of the major cities um, would have a requirement themselves. Um, so that is that is in there. Um, and it wasn't one of our main recommendations, but we certainly uh, um, are cognizant of the importance that um, at home charging would play is going to play now, plays now and in the future. Um, and believe that that can be an important driver uh, of EV adoption. Thanks, Peter. Um, okay, the next couple of questions are for our um, guest speakers here. So Jennifer and Adam, um, what have you found to be the most effective tactics for increasing EV adoption in disadvantaged communities with many um, individuals living in rental apartments? Can you speak a little bit from your experience? Jennifer, maybe I'll turn to you first. Sure, thank you. This is a tough question, um, mostly because I don't think that there is one solution that's going to fit every uh, situation. Um, and it's a very, uh, you know, diverse set of sites and a diverse set of populations. Um, so I, I think we're, you know, one, a couple of things that we're doing um, is to require early and, and continued engagement with equity focused stakeholders like community-based organizations, environmental justice groups. Um, we have a disadvantaged uh, community advisory committee in California that we um, work with to uh, better understand how to design these programs. Um, we've also launched in the funding cycle, one that I was talking about, um, uh, about $25 million for community-based organizations or community choice aggregators to propose equity-focused pilot projects, um, and we're really looking for innovative approaches to rebates to support charging infrastructure for income qualified customers or for small fleets that are located in disadvantaged communities. Um, so that's some of the action that we're taking right now. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer to the best tactic right now, but 
Um, maybe we'll turn it to New York to see what they have. <laughs> yeah, um, we are very focused, uh, you know, on both the you know personal vehicle, but also uh, beyond, you know, personal car uh, aspect for for all New Yorkers, but but in particular for uh, you know, lower income New Yorkers and, uh, and, and, uh, folks living in some of our overburdened communities, um, uh, in part because car ownership is a real burden and, um, and especially in a place that is, uh, transit rich like New York and, um, uh, and in communities where we can either there is existing transit or we can expand, uh, transit. I think that's, that's often a, uh, top priority. Uh, so a lot of the projects in the uh, clean transportation prizes are focused on things like um, uh, electric shuttle buses to connect to transit and uh, EV car sharing, uh, e-bikes and e-bike sharing and and uh, you know things like that that are really a um, uh, certainly associated with and and part of transportation electrification but uh can come at a at a much lower cost and and be more affordable and convenient uh for uh for folks who don't want to or can't uh afford to own cars um for the, on the on you know the personal vehicle ownership side you know certainly the rebates that we have in place uh help but um we are focused very much on um on street charging in new york city and in other cities um, we're focused on uh, charging in multifamily buildings and and uh, finding ways uh, to make EV ownership more convenient and and more affordable for uh, all New Yorkers. And that's a great segue, Adam, to my next question, which was um, how are California and New York thinking about charging for street parkers uh, in cities? You know, sort of beyond this question of apartment based charging, what's happening to make uh, street side charging more available. Adam, you want to go first on that front? Yeah. So uh, New York City and and Con Edison, the the utility in New York City, have uh, a great pilot project going on. They've put up a uh, hundred uh, on street chargers with plans for for thousands more, and they are um really really pushing forward you know, on street charging is is very tricky and it can be it can be tricky from an installation standpoint it can be tricky from a logistics and and standpoint and trying to make sure that the parking is available and charging is available for people when they when they want to use it and and um and how people use their cars it, it, it's very context specific but uh, we're also looking at it in other in other places, not just New York City. You know, there are um, there are opportunities for that in other in other urban areas, in smaller towns. Uh, we have been working closely with a lot of municipalities uh, across the state to really identify what the options are for uh, charge charging at public in par public parking facilities, including on street. And uh, and there are some new business models coming out. Uh, there's a there's a company in new, that's Brooklyn based called it's elect it's electric that has some really innovative approaches to how to get um, how how to make charging more accessible uh, on street uh, for for all all folks. Great, thank you, Adam. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Um, just building a little bit off of what Adam was saying, the the on street curbside parking is um, it can be really challenging, um, especially when there's a lack of street parking in a in a high you know dense urban area. Um, there are issues around how do you reserve that parking for the electric vehicle versus somebody who doesn't have an EV and what kind of equity issues does that actually bring up for people who are, don't have other options for parking than other on this than on the street. Um, so I, th I think it's a really exciting idea and and something um, that we can hopefully work on more together. One thing that we are uh, focused on in the in the funding cycle one for multi unit dwelling apartment buildings. 
um, is also where there's a high density of apartment buildings looking at DC fast charging as a solution, public DC fast charging stations uh, where um, uh, residents of apartment buildings can go, go and charge up their EVs um, in a short amount of time. Great, thank you. Um, and pivoting a little bit to another sort of community where I think the question about whether EVs, um, the question about how to deploy EVs is, is an important one is we've got a few uh, webinar participants who are from rural communities um, and they have definitely seen EVs um, have been slow to take off. So how do you convince um, you know, the rural population, for instance, to take on EVs, especially when you're looking at other politicians and other groups who are sort of unwilling to set you know, EV policies in those, in those states or targeting those communities? Uh, I, I can certainly, I, yeah. I can certainly speak for New York that uh, we've seen in recent years a proliferation of uh, EV charging stations in rural communities. I think um, we've been we've been trying to focus on uh, you know EV tourism and uh, and you know EV EVs uh, you know supporting supporting the economies of uh, of all parts of the state. Um, you know, there are EVs, I think, offer great opportunities for operational savings for rural uh, communities because they are cheaper to, you know, drive on a per mile basis. And uh, the folks who are driving more miles, um, uh, you know, the, the people who are driving more miles actually can have uh, greater savings than uh, than those who aren't driving their, their EVs very, very many miles. So, um, I think a lot of towns and communities are seeing, uh, you know, installing EV charging not as a political issue, but as a way to attract people to a downtown area and to shops and to restaurants and um, and you know, as more and more people drive EVs, that's going to be that's going to be more important in these communities. And uh, it's really about providing a providing a service to the community. Um, and and attracting attracting you know more business for for local uh, local businesses. Jennifer, any thoughts on that? Um, I would just say that you know, in addition to the extent that a rural community is situated within or adjacent to um, an agricultural community. Um, we want to think about air quality uh, benefits that can come from electrification of agricultural equipment and medium and heavy duty equipment associated with that um, ag equipment. So it's not it's not just about the um, passenger vehicles, um, but the biggest air quality impacts and benefits are going to be co are coming from electrifying those larger fleets. Yeah, and I think that is that's critical to ACEEE's um, sort of strategy for vehicle electrification as well. So, given all of that, our um, my next question is: What education and outreach tactics are you finding are particularly effective in advancing adoption of EVs equitably? Is there something in particular that you have seen work, and are there lessons to be learned from other approaches? Well, Adam, I'd like to just oh, direct oh, okay. people to uh, one of my earlier slides, and I think the slides will be um, distributed, um, has a link to a, a, a broad-based sort of stakeholder forum called VELOZ in California, at V-E-L-O-Z. Um, and they're focused on this issue. They're focused on marketing, education, and outreach um, to get information out to everyone across the state about the benefits of EVs. So I really um, direct people to, to look at the Lowe's website too. And we've done something similar on the East Coast. A uh, coalition of states have formed the uh, Drive Change, Drive Electric campaign uh, that has been going for a few years now and uh, has been focused on uh, a few Northeast states and, and really you know, spreading the word and, and building Building interest in a brand neutral manner. Um, the other thing I would just add, you know, as far as um, equity is, you know, we're we're really and and getting the message out to folks who might not normally hear it. Um, we're looking into and and uh, and we'll be coming out with programs soon that um, 
that focuses on not just putting in charging stations, but also encouraging the folks um, who are putting in the charging stations, especially uh, employers, multifamily building owners, uh, to, to help us advocate and, and inform their employees, their residents um, about EVs. So, you know, we don't want, we think it's a wasted opportunity to just put in a charging station when you can also work with the property owner, the ch charging station owner, to reach the folks that they have uh, regular contact with and uh, an easy contact with and, and are frankly more trusted than, than you know, other third parties who, who they don't who they don't know uh, to to really in, encourage further adoption of, of EVs and and educate them more about uh, the benefits and uh, that's something we'll be we'll be hopefully rolling out soon. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, I will pose one to our external speakers and the last one will be for Peter. Um, so again, on this topic of, of um, equity and disadvantaged communities, how do you integrate disadvantaged communities concern um, of electric vehicle and clean energy gentrification and community ownership of charging stations? I think there has been um, a lot of conversation about how ensuring that EV charging stations aren't promoting gentrification will be very important moving forward. So I'm just curious if either of you have had experience um, uh, addressing those issues or have come across them in your engagement with the communities in your states. Uh, that has definitely come up in, in our conversations with, with uh, community members across the state and uh, there is a real interest in making sure that the benefits of electrification accrue in the community, and that can be through, you know, job, uh, you know, workforce development programs and job training programs. It can be through, um, and and kind of, you know, local local um, you know, local requirements for for labor on installations it could be through you know local ownership of of stations it could be um through you know focusing on focusing on small fleets and and small businesses uh when we're talking about medium and heavy duty electrification and not just uh and making sure all the incentive money doesn't just go to you know big multinational company fleets that um you know that are that are doing this everywhere so um, we are trying to integrate those concerns into all of our different programs. Um, and, you know, I think that's, it's an emerging and evolving uh, topic that we're still figuring out exactly what the right approach is, but it's something that we're, uh, we're keenly interested in and, and, uh, and, you know, making sure it's integrated into our programs. Um, yeah, I think um, I think what we're finding as well is um, we, you know, the strategy in the past has been to earmark a certain amount of incentive dollars uh, towards um, communities of concern, and this is really important. Those are, that financial um, incentive needs to be there, but that's not enough either. And I think I've already mentioned a few of the stakeholder forums and forums where we're uh, working with envir environmental justice communities, with um, equity-focused stakeholders, community-based organizations to ensure that programs are designed in a way that bring the most benefits um, to the community members. And also asking for ideas from these communities and opening up a platform for those ideas to come in and have access to funding as well. Yeah, I think the uh, direct engagement with communities is going to be critical for whatever policies we think about moving forward. Um, okay, so for the last question, I want to take a slightly different tack and ask Peter, um, so as the adoption of EVs grows and adds to demands on the grid, do you think that there will need be a need to look at the efficiency of EVs um, in the same way that fuel efficiency of vehicles currently is um, evaluated by the EPA and through the federal fuel efficiency standards. And obviously this question is particularly relevant, I think, for the light duty uh, vehicle market. So I'd be curious to hear your take on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, as, as you said, as we've considered 
the you know importance of gasoline vehicle and diesel vehicle efficiency for decades and recognized how important it is to increase that, we should be doing the same for electric vehicles. I think there's a number of, of benefits to it in terms of um, obviously minimizing the impacts on the grid. Those are always good. Um, you know, delaying the types of upgrades that might be necessary as we electrify is always good. Um, obviously, our grid at the moment is not um, fully decarbonized. There, so there are still emissions from EVs, even if they are upstream um, and lower than gasoline vehicles overall. They're they're still not zero. So we need to also be be factoring those in. Um, and then also with more efficient vehicles, um, you can get you know, more bang for your buck from a similar battery pack or be able to, you know, have a smaller battery um, and being able to, to, to run a similar distance. And that'll be good in terms of saving on minerals, which will have an environmental and emissions benefit, but also from a supply chain perspective, being able to um, take better advantage of the supply chain that exists. Um, and we didn't necessarily tackle these issues in the scorecard. Um, this has generally not been something that um, states have done a lot of action around, although there certainly are things that they could be doing potentially around, you know, registration fees um, or other things um, of the like. And of course, obviously, California also has a unique um, advantage in terms of their own regulations. Um, but we, this has been a, a core component of some of our federal advocacy work. So I would um, direct people to some of our other things that um, HEEE has put out on, on this topic. Great, thank you so much. So I think we've, we're at the top of the hour um, and I would just like to take a moment to uh, thank our great panel for participating um, in today's webinar and helping us release the second edition of the Transportation Electrification Scorecard. I think this has been a great conversation. So I'm, I'm, I really, really appreciate your time and effort. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able obviously to get to all of the questions, but um, we will attempt to download all the questions from the Q&A panel here and, and answer them as, pos as, as, you know, as much as possible. Um, if, you're, if you would like a, a more immediate answer to your burning question, feel free to go out to Peter or to me or the other authors of the report and we'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, just as a reminder, we will be sending all attendees the slides and a link to the webinar. Um, so you'll be hearing from us soon. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy uh, your day and we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you all.